All right, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Reed Kramer. I direct the Asset Building Program here at the New America Foundation. And uh, our mission is to significantly increase um, access to economic resources through increased savings and asset ownership, uh, particularly families with lower incomes and fewer resources, uh, so that there's an enhanced sense of economic security, families get a direct stake in the commonwealth and, and a means to pursue their aspirations. Uh, for a number of reasons, we're, we're extremely pleased to uh, host and help uh, sponsor this uh, gathering today, um, focused on the question of what is asset building for working families in a down economy. Uh, so really, yeah, for, for a number of reasons. First off, um, we uh, uh, have been pleased to work with our, our friends and colleagues over at the Capital Area Asset Builders Organization. Um, they do great work. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with their work in uh, financial education and counseling and in um, providing access to match savings uh, programs, tax preparation, uh, great work. Uh, and they also have an awareness that, that policy uh, matters. They care about the policy process uh, as well. Uh, they know that D.C. is uh, really the, the focal point of a lot of federal policy making, but it's also a place that uh, almost half a million people uh, call home. Uh, and so their, their, their focus at the local level is very much um, appreciated. Uh, another reason we're, we're pleased to, to, to welcome you here is that uh, my, my colleagues and I in the Asset Building Program uh, have been spending quite a bit of uh, focus and, and attention in trying to understand some of the impacts of what's going on uh, in the economy right now. Um, uh, I think saying that it's a down economy, as we've done in the, the title of this event, uh, is a little bit of a euphemism uh, for many people. Uh, they're being hit quite hard uh, by the uh, impacts of the Great Recession, uh, in addition to stagnant wages and job loss, and, and certainly the wave of foreclosures are, are really uh, troubling um, and uh, are issues that are, that are uh, of concern to us in, in, in uh, Washington, D.C., but also across uh, the country. Um, it's certainly a time when we, we might be revisiting our assumptions uh, and kind of asking critical questions about how we approach uh, some of the um, uh, problems uh, of the day. Uh, for example, the, the home ownership issue is really one that's ripe for re-examining. Uh, certainly the risks of home ownership have been exposed through the recent experience, uh, and yet there's still promise that um, needs to be kept in mind for getting people on a pathway forward uh, in their lives. So we want to be able to find the potential uh, in the home ownership process uh, as well. Um, in, in our work, I think there really is a mandate to look for new uh, pathways and new solutions for households with lower incomes and fewer resources, getting them to move forward in their lives on the way to social development uh, for themselves, for their children, and their entire uh, communities. Um, and, and finally, the, the third reason we're thrilled to, to welcome you here um, is uh, you know th th there is an imperative to continue this conversation and, and to seek these new uh, solutions. That there's much work that needs to be done to create a responsive policy process, certainly at the federal level where we do a lot of our thinking. Uh, but it's at the local level where the rubber meets the road, where a lot of the hard work uh, gets done, and there's a lot of lessons uh, to be uh, learned. So. Um, we are um, engaged in a process of identifying these, uh, these issues amidst the crisis and trying to find where there are new opportunities to move um, ahead. And we're fortunate that CAB is helping to facilitate this discussion. And um, we want to support their efforts. And we want to associate ourselves with their success. And we also want to uh, engage and learn from uh, from, from their experiences as well. So that's the general welcome. Uh, make yourselves at home. Um, enjoy the discussion. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you uh, outside to make you comfortable. Uh, but uh, look forward to your um, thoughts and participation in the day ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I just want to start by saying uh, thank you to the New America Foundation and CAB for hosting this event. Um, I'm Nikki Guarin. I'm president of Washington Area Women's Foundation, and I'm really thr thrilled to be here to be part of this discussion 
what is asset building for working families in a down economy? Um, and that question really, um, and the theme of today's events could not be more timely. I think many of you in the room are familiar with the Women's Foundation, but briefly, we're the region's only public foundation dedicated solely to improving the lives of women and girls in the Washington metropolitan area. And we do this primarily through our Women's Economic Security Initiative called Stepping Stones. And Stepping Stones is a research-based grant-making initiative that we launched back in, 2000, uh, back in 2005. And it came about after a 2003 report that we released documenting the status of women and girls. So back in 2003, we found that single female-headed households were the most economically vulnerable population in this region. And we identified four issue areas that are critical to lifting these families out of poverty. One is asset building. The second is workforce development. The third was early care and education. And finally, health and safety. And to date, our asset building work has focused on reducing debt, increasing savings, and putting women on a path towards home ownership. We've had many successes over the past five years, including over 280 women who have purchased homes for the first time. But we know that there continue to be many, many challenges, particularly in this economy. And just last month, we released an update to the 2003 report, the 2010 Portrait of Women and Girls in the Washington Metropolitan Area. And probably not surprising to many of you in the room, the 2010 report found an increase in poverty among women and girls. We have more than 170,000 women and girls in our region living in poverty. And the District of Columbia has exceptionally high poverty rates for black women and girls at 26%. We know that a woman's economic security is partially dependent on having assets and resources to tide her over during tough times. And yet nearly half of the female-headed households are considered asset poor, compared to 35% of male-headed households. And in addition, half of female-headed households are either un unbanked or underbanked. Female-headed families with children face the greatest housing affordability, affordability challenges, with almost two-thirds, 62%, having unaffordable housing costs, and 32% living in housing that is considered severely unaffordable. They also have the lowest home ownership rate of all household types in the region. So given these statistics and given the econ economic downturn and the incredibly slow recovery that we're seeing unfolding, we, we have to ask ourselves, what is asset building for low income working families? Have we been on the right path? Is this the right path going forward? And are there other strategies that need to be examined? So I'm very, very pleased to be here today to participate and support this event and look forward to learning more about how we collectively can partner together to address the needs of low-income women and their families. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, so much for coming. I'm Arita Cole, Executive Director of CAB. And uh, Rita, I'd like to thank you for all the nice things that you said about um, CAB. I share those things. I've been at CAB for seven months now, and it's been just a pleasure to be involved in the kinds of um, cutting edge and groundbreaking uh, dialogues and direct services programs that CAB's been involved in. Um, I would like, this could not have been possible if it weren't for the support of the Washington Area Women's Foundation and CFED. I'd like to um, uh, really thank Nikki Gorin um, of Washington Area Women's Foundation and Jennifer Lockwood Shabbat, who worked with us to develop um, this concept. And, um, and CFED as well. When I first started, I didn't really know what CFED was. I learned a lot of that from my staff. Um, and um, now that I'm involved with it, I see that CAB does have a role in convening. Uh, we're direct services organization in the Washington metro area, but I realize that we really do have a role in convening all of the different um, uh, players in the nonprofit area and at the federal and state area. And I'm thrilled that we our keynote speaker today, um, Dr. Wilhelmina Lay from the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. I'm just thrilled to bring together all the different experts and voices to uh, on this uh, issue. Um, I'd also like to, if I may, take a moment to thank a couple of other people. Um, I don't know if they're here yet, but um, both of the council members, Kwame Brown and Michael Brown, I'm thinking of them now as the Brown Breakers because it's clear that they are really determined to do some um, groundbreaking um, work in the area of um, asset building and economic development. 
and I don't know if she's here, but Jeanette Purcell from um, uh, D.C. Office of Insurance and uh, Securities and Banking, Mel Hardy from the IRS here, who has a whole, um, IRS has a whole different uh, take on financial education and asset building that I'm thrilled that you all are going to get exposed to today if you don't know about it already. And Jerry Flavin from the SBA, Office of Faith-Based Initiatives and Neighborhood Partnerships. Um, I'd also like to thank, um, I can't see out there too well because of the lights, but CAB board members who uh, may be here, Catherine Clay from PNC Bank, Kara Morell from Higher Heights uh, Consulting, um, and Di Diana Meyer of uh, City, who's on our fundraising board um, committee. And last but definitely not least, I'd like to thank um, the CAB staff who have worked. This is my first work in nonprofit world. And um, so I've had a little bit of a you know culture adjustment but the, the people who have really made it um, worth my while have been the CAB staff who work so diligently. Uh, um, I'd like to thank first um, our former executive director, Colleen Daly, um, who teed this all up and then uh, went on maternity leave, creating an opportunity for me to make a career change. And also Marian Savitt, um, Shawnee Lee, Charles Pearson, and the brainchild of this event, uh, Miss Emily Apple over here. If you like this I idea of what we're doing with having these policy forums, this is the first in the series, but the brainchild for this is our Emily Apple, and I'd really like for everybody to acknowledge her, and thank you, Emily. So I hope you enjoy yourselves, and, um, and thank you for coming. Thank you so much to uh, Reed, Maruta, and Nikki for those wonderful welcomes. I'm excited to get to dive right into our action-packed uh, program that will give you a chance to learn about what is going on uh, in areas of asset building in Washington, D.C., and how you can get more involved if that's uh, something you and your organization um, can commit to. So I'll, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mel Hardy from the IRS to talk about his, uh, the IRS's new commitment to asset building. Thank you, Emily. I was uh, hoping to uh, follow the council members, because uh, usually being an IRS person, that's a tough sell, so uh, <laughs> bear with me. Um, but no, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to this uh, organization and to this group. Uh, I first want to thank uh, Marita and Emily for inviting me here today to speak on this very, very important issue. I am the acting territory manager uh, in the IRS organization called SPEC, which is, stands for Stakeholders, Partnerships, Education, and Communication. Say that three times. Um, I've met many of you in the room, and um, I'm excited about the fact that we are exposing this audience to what the IRS is doing as it relates to financial education and asset building. Tax time is an important time to look at the opportunity to leverage uh, resources for those who are low income or moderate income. And uh, CAB and the DC uh, EITC campaign had a phenomenal year. Um, and together with our national partners, more than 3 million returns were provided to American taxpayers. And those refunds were in excess of $3 billion. This is money that is greatly needed in all communities, but especially those that are underserved. And this program, uh, where the returns came from, was obviously from what we call the Volunteer Return Preparation Program. Some of you out in the audience know it as VITA, Volunteer Income Tax Assistance, which provides free tax assistance for low to moderate income individuals. Now, one of the refundable credits that um, a taxpayer is able to avail themselves to is the earned income tax credit. And low to moderate income individuals are able to get back a certain amount on their refund if they earn income. This year, uh, the amount was probably almost 4000 that some people could get back on their refunds. We have a national EITC Awareness Day, and that will be happening on January, Friday, January 28th, uh, 2011, and this will be a great opportunity for all of you uh, to spread the EITC message. 
my office, of course, uh, here in D.C., will pledge support to that effort. So why is the IRS here talking to this very distinguished group? Well, several years ago, uh, the Internal Revenue Service saw the need to get involved in financial education and asset building. And it was really an easy jump because we had already been involved with VITA and we knew that many of our partners, like CAB, were doing asset building. So the IRS has taken on the responsibility of using financial education and asset building as another critical area to help those uh, build assets and create wealth. And of course, I want to uh, extend a profound thanks to the leadership that is here uh, today for all of your efforts. This event today uh, is a testament to the need for a dialogue on this particular issue. This summer, many of our partners uh, played a critical role in a series of webcasts entitled Turning Partnerships into Opportunities. It was hosted by the IRS Spec, but we tapped into many of our national partners. The webcast was a great success. Nearly 3,000 partners signed up to view our webcast. So once uh, we have that up and going, uh, perhaps again, we will send out information so that people can uh, also watch the new webcast. And so in closing, I want to let everyone know that the IRS is committed to asset building. One of the ways that we do this uh, through my organization, SPEC, uh, which stands for Stakeholders, Partnerships, and Education and Communication, is to provide outreach information to uh, nonprofit organizations and others that are trying to reach the low to moderate income. The financial education and asset building program is really uh, getting geared up, so we look forward to partnering with other organizations, perhaps uh, doing something also here again with CAB at the New American Foundation. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to this, today's program. If you could just bear with us one moment. There's a very important vote that's going on today with the council. So we're going to check and see if either of the council members are here. And if they're not, we're going to proceed with our keynote speaker, Dr. Wilhelmina Lay. Um, could you come up? Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, I think so. Okay. Um, I'll start by saying, first of all, a thanks to CAB and to its sponsors and to the host of this forum for asking me to come and speak. Now, I was asked to talk about how asset building can help serve as an antidote to poverty in the long run, because it's not going to be a short run fix. And I'm going to start by defining the term asset, just so we all are thinking about the same concept as I speak. And an asset is a valuable item that is owned and that can, can be turned into cash to cover liabilities, such as debt or expenditures that are going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thus, assets are not cash. They can't really be spent in a very direct way, but they can be used to generate cash as, as needed. So given the way I have defined assets, everybody at every income level can benefit from having them. And especially people at lower income levels can benefit from having them because having uh, assets can allow you to have a means to have, a, have food to eat, a place to sleep, and a roof over your head while you're undertaking training, going to school, doing other things to help you get out of being poor, to help you work your way out of being poor. So now that I have defined assets, I'm going to move on and give you some egg examples of it. And this is probably... A, a, a little too basic for some of you, but I think it'll be helpful um, as, as I go on through my comments. Now, I'll start with the asset that's the most liquid, 
and that's financial assets. Those are, you know, money in the bank, uh, CDs, savings accounts, money market accounts, and also money in bonds and stocks and mutual funds. Those are liquid assets or the more liquid kind. Because you put your money in a place, it stays there, people do things with it, and you earn money, and you can draw cash out of it, and it's fairly simple. Now, there are other types of assets, and we're going to talk especially about housing as an asset in, in, in the next panel, but it's the dominant form of asset holding in this country. Um, it's the it's 52% of the median net worth of white households, and it's more than 70% of the median net worth of African American households and Latino households. So it's clearly an, an asset. It's a way that you have a place to live on an ongoing basis um, while you're doing other things. Owning a business, that's another example of, of an asset. Certainly if you own it, a business has value in and of itself, but it allows you, as you do the things that your business does, it allows you to generate a stream of cash. So business can also be an asset. And if you work for a business, you can get access to some other types of assets. You can get access to health insurance, which can generate a stream of cash payments um, if you need them when you incur medical expenses. Um, you can also perhaps get access to a retirement plan, a way that you can put money in and then get money out later when you're no longer working. Education is another example of an asset. Um, once you have gone to school, that schooling is something that you own and you have your whole lifetime to make use of it and to generate cash for yourself based on that. And having access to health insurance coverage is yet one, one more example of an asset. Because again, whether you get it from the government, whether you get it from your employer, or, because, or whether you get it because you own a business, um, this coverage can generate a stream of cash that can help you meet your medical expenses. So I've explained to some extent what an asset is, and I've given you some ex examples of it. So how can we help low-income people acquire assets? And from my perspective, we can do so by using what I'll call a one-two punch. And what do I mean by the, a one-two punch? The first part of the punch, or the first punch, is giving people cash or cash substitutes or other things that are in the way of supports to help them deal with the fact that they don't have enough income, they need money to buy food, they need a roof over their heads. But the second part of it is to give people the tools, the knowledge, the skills, so that they can make the best use of whatever assets they acquire during their lifetimes. And this uh, second part, you know, these tools, knowledge, or skills is what I call asset savoir-faire, which is perhaps just a fancy word for something, but it means that people have assets and they know what to do with them. And I think you have to have both to, to be able to use them to best ad advantage during one's life. Now, a slightly different way to think about the same one-two punch is to think about the expression that I'm sure many of you have, have heard. If you give a man a fish, you have given him a meal. You have given him food for a meal. But if you teach a man how to fish, you have taught him how to feed himself for his whole lifetime. And that's the sort of distinction that I'm trying to make here. The difference between giving a person a fish and teaching them how to fish. And I think as we try to help people build a assets, we have to think about doing both. So I'm going to run through some Ex some examples based on the asset scorecard from CFED that illustrate what I think the fish is and what I think teaching someone to fish is. And there's a, a, dis there's a difference in each example, but I think it'll help make the point that 
giving someone a fish is not quite the whole thing. You have to give them the fish and you have to also teach them how to fish. Now on the CFED scorecard, Washington DC area got a C on fin financial asset outcomes. So what could Washington DC do in terms of giving a fish to low income people under this category? Well, what they could do is to fund an IDA program with a match for low income people to help them save for education, training, home ownership, business development. That would constitute giving them a fish. Now, what would constitute teaching them how to fish? Teaching them how to fish would be not only setting up the IDA program and giving them the match, but giving them training, education along the way, and especially as they get closer to the point where they have saved what they can save to meet their goal, to help them know the best way to make use of the money that, that they have saved. So you can give them the fish by setting up the IDA program, but you can teach them how to fish by telling them exactly what it is they can do, their full range of options, what's the best way to go about um, moving toward their particular goal. Excuse me, let me get some water. Okay, let's move on to a second area. If we look at business D development. On the CFED scorecard, DC got an A, but we could still do, do better or do, do more in terms of asset outcomes. Now, in the case of business de development, I'll say that the fish here could be the fact that DC does currently uh, make unemployment insurance, unemployment benefits available both to full-time and part-time workers. Teaching how to fish under this particular heading, I, I think if the Washington DC decided to support people who are unemployed with uninsurance benefits while they're taking courses to learn how to run a business or while they are building their business and getting it up off, off of the ground. That would be an example of how to teach a fish. I mean, how, how to teach them how to fish. So if we give them a fish, we're doing that currently, giving them the unemployment benefits but allowing them to still get unemployment benefits while they're doing such things as learning how to start a business, learning how to run a business, so it won't be that they start a business and it fails within its first six months. Now, moving on to a third area, Washington, D.C. did miserably in housing and home ownership on the CFED scorecard. We got a D rating out of A, B, C, D, and F, for those who may not know the scorecard. Uh, we rank last in the nation on home, home ownership with a 40% ownership rate, so we clearly need to do better. Now, the fish in this case would, would be for Washington, D.C. to make guaranteed funding available for their housing production trust fund and for HPAP, the Home Purchase Assistance Program for First-Time buyers. That would be the fish. We're not currently doing that. When I say a guaranteed, guaranteed funding, I mean something like establishing a um, funding stream that is dedicated to the purpose of funding these two kinds of programs <laughs> and something like the money that DC has for a uh, e every time they record a deed, somebody pays a fee, dedicate that fee, something like that. Now, teaching someone how to fish in this case is uh, the example would, would be offering housing counseling prior to purchase, having a housing counselor on site at the closing, and having a housing counselor accessible to these recent, recent purchasers during year one, two, three, four, five, let's say, because purchasing a house is not where it stops you can very easily lose it in the first year or two if you didn't have enough money saved up and your roof needed fixing, or uh, if something else happened that you, you know, didn't, didn't expect. 
and you didn't have any backup or any way to uh, deal with that. So those are a few examples that I would pull from uh, the CFED scorecard about things that we could do, teaching, you know, giving people a fish, and then teaching people how to fish in terms of building assets. So thus far, I have defined an asset, and I've spoken about what I call my one-two punch. So I'll close by saying a few things about what you can do during this current down economic situation in terms of having money available to work with people to build assets. Now, the first thing is not rocket science, and I'm sure that I'm not the first person to think of it, but it's to try and make more use of federal dollars and less use of local dollars, because the local dollars are probably scarce, um, and use the federal monies to help you with your local asset building programs. Now, this strategy, of course, isn't feasible if every non-federal unit of government in this country realizes the same thing and applies the same approach, tapping into the federal pot of money rather than the local pot of money. But I do think the federal government has deeper pockets than the D.C. government, so it does make some sense to apply this strategy. And what I'm talking about is if you're going to establish an IDA program, if you target TANF beneficiaries, then you can use TANF money to help you establish and fund that program. If you decide you want to assist more than just TANF beneficiaries, if you want to assist all a broader group of low-income people, then you could use CDBG money, the HUD, the HUD money, uh, Community Development Block Grant money, that is more open-ended in terms of its usage. You could use that money. So those are just two examples of the way you could support doing asset building work uh, in an era when the economy is down and local funds are a bit scarce. A second way that you could move forward in funding uh, programs to help build assets is to tap into what I call low-cost or no-cost ways to uh, support program efforts, and I'll give a few examples. Um, as of the 2009 tax filing for the District of Columbia, uh, those of us like me who pay taxes here, um, were, we were not able to split our refund checks. We could have it mailed to one place. Why not make it possible to have the refund check split, especially for people who are getting the EITC refunds, and allow part of it to go to a checking account and part of it to go directly to a savings or an, an investment account? Now, what's the point here? The point is that if you take the money before it gets into your checking account and put some of it into a savings account, the chances are a little greater that some of that's going to stay the money that gets into the savings account. Uh, if it all goes into the checking account, it'll probably all be lost in the wash and spent and, and not saved. So that's one example of something that the D.C. government could, could do to help foster asset building. Wouldn't cost much, shouldn't take much to implement. A second example of what uh, might be done is allowing TANF beneficiaries to satisfy their re requirement for work by taking courses in financial education. Um, that might be an example of a way to help um, do something low cost, no cost. A third example would be to increase the amount of TANF monies. Again, this is tapping into a federal program. But to in increase the percentage of TANF funds that are used for workforce training. A very small percentage is currently used, about 2%. And finally, one way to go about it would be to establish categorical eligibility for benefit programs. Instead of having low-income households qualify separately for WIC, qualify separately for SNAP, qualify separately for TANF, establish a 
one way of doing it, eligibility, that covered all of the programs. And there are numerous examples of ways other states have tried it. This would lessen the administrative cost of running the programs that currently offer the fish, in quotes, that in the example I've talked about so far. So here's my bottom line. Despite its reputation as a recession-proof e economy bolstered by the presence of the federal government, Washington, D.C. has not only shadow representation in Congress, but we have a shadow city here where lots of people live at the bottom of the economic ladder and don't have a clear or visible way up or out. One of every four D.C. residents is asset poor, and that means without income, they could not live at the federal poverty level for more than three months. Economic times are tough, but we want to have a city here of fisher women and fisher men, people who know how to fish, as well as fish eaters, the people who can eat the fish that someone gives them. So, and I think that a well thought out and supportive environment for asset building that has both of those aspects, the fish and teaching how to fish, can help us get there. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the rest of the discussions. Did, did you want me to do that? I, oh, did you want to? Okay. Thank you so much to Wilhelmina for um, giving us that, that overview and background of asset building and bringing us all onto the same page about what asset building can mean and its importance to low and moderate income families. I wasn't able to introduce uh, Dr. Wilhelmina Lay, a Senior Research Associate at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. And if you are not aware of the recent uh, publications that, that she has put out about asset building in low-income communities of color, I would especially in encourage you to look for that on, on their website because this is, again, it talks more about the racial wealth gap and in a city like Washington, D.C., where that is kind of the definition of, of, of where the line of poverty is often drawn, it's uh, definitely worth checking out. So um, if we'd like to take a couple of questions from the audience, if anyone has questions for Dr. Lay. anyone here who hasn't um, read, there's two papers that are, are published on mm -hmm. the Joint Center's web website um, on asset building and how um, IDAs and other asset building kinds of programs um, affect, I, I think the, the study that you had was how they specifically affect people of color. Mm -hmm. And I would like to, considering, you know, Washington, D.C. and how the, the change, you know, the diversity, the growing diversity in Washington the um, various uh, socioeconomic, um, you know, sectors that are coming up. Can you think of anything that might specifically um, work in Washington that you've seen in some other places? I know that you cited San Francisco and some other places as being some um, uh, great places where asset building initiatives mm -hmm. were working to bridge the wealth gap that was kind of a racially based wealth gap. That's a, that's a very strong order here for, for a question. Um, I think one of the things that sort of, of happens, and I was trying to get at it in my closing comments, there is a shadow city here. The, you know, Washington is a place that has so many people coming here who are well-educated, um, often coming from families with means. And they f it's like they function on two very different levels. There's that, that federal city, and then there's that rest of us. Um, and, and there's not an easy way to, to, to bridge that, and there's sure, surely not a short way, um, other than trying to compensate for some of the deficits that people who have been here all along without the benefit of a city that, you know, we don't have senators in Congress. We have uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, but, 
you know, it's, she doesn't really have a vote. You know, I mean, it's it's that kind of thing that that we can't, we don't have and haven't ever had. Now, there are examples from other parts of the country where there are very diverse populations um, of things that seem to work. And D.C. has started, because I've seen these ads on the buses, about Bank on D.C. That one came about as far as I know, largely started in San Francisco, the bank on San Francisco, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not limited to that place. People have to start where they are. And if people grow up thinking that it's a norm to go to the post office when you get money at the end of the month or the first of the month or whatever, to get Uh, money orders to pay your bills, which is a mindset that a lot of lower income people have, and it's a product of the way they were raised, the way they live, the way they get their money. They don't have accounts. You know, you have to start where people are. And I think giving people a firm understanding of the building blocks, you know, if you've never had a checking account, you aren't likely to be open to somebody talking to you about investing in bonds or stocks or mutual funds because you just don't get it. You can't make that that kind of of leap. So, you know, it's almost like everybody, but this never happens. You know, I've, I've always said when people are born, as they come out, inside the umbilical cord there should be instructions. This is the way you should treat Wilhelmina Lay for the next 80 years and she will have a wonderful life. She will be in good health. She will, you know, get a good job. She will do, you know. I think everybody needs to be born with that. I think also at some point in their lives, somebody needs to sit down with everybody and it doesn't happen within the family context. So maybe that's the kind of, of answer to your question talk to people about where they are, you know, what their education is, what they want to do, what their resources are, what they have aptitude for, you know, do they have children, do they want to have children, what, what sort of um, money needs do they have, and help people map out a life course plan. You know, if I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, which I need to do or have to do for whatever reason, I need to have these kinds of resources in place here, there, and, and everywhere. And it doesn't seem to happen. You know, if, if, you, if you have to go into the Army, you go, and for some lower income people, this is your first real physical, where they check out everything in your physical body to see that you're OK shape to go into the Army. Um, maybe there needs to be a point where people somewhere along the way get that kind of conversation, you know, because if it doesn't come from your mother and father and it's because your mother and father can't talk to you that way because nobody ever explained all those things to them, you know, it's, excuse me, it's a very big question and like all big questions, there are no um, silver bullets and there are no quick answers, but that's my stab at it. Hi, Bill Varitoni with Community Ladders. Uh, You talked about um, uh, widespread financial education being part of um, the teaching to fish concept, but what would that look like uh, in terms of widespread? Would it be nonprofit-led or government-led? Thank you. That's That's a very good question, and I have some definite opinions about that, so thank you for asking it. Um, First of all, I think you have to start young. You have to start when the kids have, and I can, till the day I die, I can recall this, I had a piggy bank and my mother and father would give me 50 cents a week and I could put it in the piggy bank. And periodically I could take money and go around the corner, there was a five and 10 not far from where I was living, and buy something. And every time I went around there, I didn't have enough money. Every single time, you know, I was always short by something. And I I don't know whether it was because I couldn't count good enough or my eyes were bigger than my stomach when I got in the store. 
Um, but the clerks knew me. They knew where I lived. They knew who my parents were. And they knew that if I said I'd go back home and get the other 50 cents and bring it back, I would. So, but that was a learning experience for me. I was fortunate enough to have a piggy bank. The surrogate for that in modern times is to start with schools like I know Ariel Investments works with a school in Chicago that they get the kids, you know, first grade, and they teach them math like you wouldn't believe because they have given them a certain amount of money when they come in and they get to play around, around with the money. And what they earn from the money, you know, over the 12 years or so, I, I don't know how long the school, you know, if it's a full school or just half a school, but uh, the money that they earn, they get to take with them. They have to leave the corpus for the next class that comes in. You know, like if they get a thousand dollars when they come in, whatever they earn, by the time they, they leave, they get to take that $250, let's say, that they may have earned on that thousand. Um, but they learn math, they understand how markets work, they understand options for investing money, and they come out a whole lot ahead of the game in terms of other people, in terms of dealing with money. Now that's one approach, but that doesn't help all of the adults who are out here who made it through school, didn't have parents who, like mine, who grew up during the Depression, and the thought of not having money was enough to teach me to always have money, you know. Um, everybody doesn't have those life-changing sort of experiences, but for adults who are out here without them, I do think that the nonprofit setting is a good way to go, but I also think that adults are very busy people. They won't just go to a class if they don't have to. And I mentioned the TANF example. If you're a TANF recipient and you're required to do work, make taking a financial education course qualify as work. Or if you're, again, if you are interested in buying a house, you have you can't buy a house without going through this course. You know, set up a series of things where you have to do it so that you will do it as an adult and you will focus. You know, taking a financial education course in the abstract is probably not very helpful, you know, because it's like taking uh and I've done this a a course in learning how to use Excel on the PC, you know, if I'm not going to use Excel, if I've got no current use for Excel, what's the point in taking the Excel course, except that it's being offered and I can do so? Um, so I, I think linking it to something that they really want, you have to learn this other stuff before you can do this thing that you really want. Um, having it through credit unions where people work, that's one other idea, and having it so that if you take this course, it's like um, if you take a safe driver's course, you get so much off on your car insurance. Uh, or, you know, have courses set up through the credit unions where people work, and then perhaps give them a $50 bonus or whatever for, and they can, you know, the $50 bonus goes directly into their credit union account or something like that. But those are the ways that I think doing something like that really works. Because if, it's, if, if you haven't had it and you're now 35, you're going to have to have a strong reason for getting it. Um, and hopefully that reason won't be because you're so hopelessly in debt that you can't see the light of day. Um, but I'm very excited, obviously, that people do have a lot of questions. Um, so let me say, hold off on that. We actually, after the plenary, that's the next part of the session, there's going to be a 15-minute break. And so I'm, I hope that Dr. Lay can stay around and maybe answer your question at that point, or maybe it will be addressed during one of the during the plenary or one of the session topics. The reason why I'm very ex um, excited to cut off questions, though, is because actually Councilmember Michael Brown has been able to join us. Uh, Michael Brown is a is an at-large council member for the, in the D.C. Council, and he is the chairperson of the Committee on Housing and Workforce Development. He has introduced and supported a, 
a series of, of legislation this year that has been very meaningful for asset building and protecting the safety net for low-income working families. And I'm very excited to um, offer him the opportunity to address you about his um, goals and plan for that. Thank you so much, Council Member. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Wow. <laughs> there are cookies in out there. There's sugar and everything. If you need a sugar rush. I, uh, I first want to uh, want to thank you very much for being here. I think it's important we give the capital area asset builders another wonderful hand for the wonderful work that they do here in our, in our city. Um, I, I'm, I was listening to some of the discussion uh, earlier that your keynote was giving, and uh, I want to give you a little backdrop before we talk a little bit about um, home ownership and TANF and, and trying to how we uh, try to level the playing field for folks that are at the low end of the economic totem pole. Um, the backdrop is clearly um, gentrification is alive and well here in the District of Columbia, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as people aren't being displaced. And there seems to be some of that going on. Now, I am not one to put walls up around our city. I think we need as many new residents as possible, come one, come all. But I don't think we have to make room for them by kicking out older D.C. residents. I'm not talking older in age. I'm talking D.C. residents that have been here a long time. And I think part of the frustration for some of our residents is they're seeing some of these new services and restaurants coming into their communities. And the question is, are those being brought into their communities for them or for the new residents? Now, it can't be both. But it shouldn't be one or the other. And so I think a lot of our residents, especially folks that have relied on affordable housing in this city for quite some time, uh, are looking at a place where they don't feel welcome. And one of the things that we have done is I authored, uh, I don't know, about maybe about a year ago, uh, trying to redefine what affordable housing means. For those who think $320,000 for a two-bedroom condo is affordable housing, it is not. Um, and so what we have to do is try to redefine for those who know, the AMI. The AMI is the area median income, which is a little skewed for us because it also includes Arlington, Fairfax, Montgomery County, and our AMI, which raises our, our salaries up relative to pricing on housing. So what we need to do is kind of have our own AMI uh, here in the District of Columbia, which I think will bring it down the way we have calculated, at least in my bill, is bring it down to about maybe 40000 40, maybe $45,000. Because what we'd like to do is have our teachers, our firefighters, police officers, janitors, retired folks, secretaries be able to afford to live here. Because the key of any fiscal um, longevity for a city or any jurisdiction is to have uh, what, I, what I like to call economic diversity. And that way you don't have to get into the labels of other kinds of diversity. I'm talking economic diversity. And if you look at some of the other cities in America that have done a Philadelphia's one, New York, even Los Angeles, uh, they have, you could have a police officer living in the same community as doctors and lawyers. And that's okay. We shouldn't be afraid of that. But for some reason, for the last several years, um, I think folks are afraid to have that kind of economic diversity. Frankly, I think it's more vibrant if you have more than one kind of person in a city. That's A. Uh, B, if there's been a city here already uh, that are, has already had neighborhoods and folks that have been here, we, they shouldn't feel unwelcome. So I wanted to give you that backdrop uh, relative to housing here in the District of Columbia and home ownership. Clearly, during these tough time, economic times, being a renter is much easier. Um, you don't have to put down those big down payments. Uh, we get that. But what we want to do is try to get folks to graduate to that because that's part of a wealth building system. And a lot of our folks, and I know you were just talking about our banking system and financial, financial. The reason there are so many check cashing places here in the District of Columbia and they serve a wonderful purpose. I am not trying to drive them out of business at all. Um, but there is a lot of intimidation when it comes to banks. And a lot of folks do not understand how they work, why they operate the way they do. Hence, they go to the check cashing place, which takes, uh, we, we're trying to change those fees now if, you, if you've been watching. By the way, if you can never sleep at night, just turn on channel 13 and we'll put you right to sleep. <laughs> um, because what, what occurs is we, we're trying to change how much the check cashing places can charge when folks cash their checks because they take a big, big hunk when, in some cases, banks don't take any. And that's part of the education of getting folks to understand the financial services can be the friend, not necessarily their enemy or adversary. 
So kind of that wealth building system uh, related to home ownership is extremely important. As you know, we have the, for everything from the Homestead Act, but one of the things that we are trying also trying to create as we pass these laws is also to educate folks along the way. Because one thing to pass laws, but if folks don't understand them and can't take advantage of them, what's the point of the law? Um, so what we try to do, and that's why I have these exhaustive hearings that some of my colleagues get angry at me about. Um, but I want to give folks as much information as possible rather than too little. And, not, and that has nothing to do, frankly, with the merits of the particular bill. It's just about giving everyone a chance to be able to speak and getting the experts in so everyone can hear both sides of the equation. Because believe it or not, uh, I have some opposition to the changing the affordable, uh, affordable housing definition. Um, some folks don't want to do that. Because, again, there are, there are some forces here uh, that believe. And, like, I went to school in Boston. I went to undergrad in Boston. Boston and San Francisco are great cities. But I don't want to be them. I want to be D.C. And if you, if you have that premise, then I think you're more prone um, to want to have that kind of economic diversity in our city. So whether it's wealth building through home ownership uh, for TANF, for the, and I heard you talking about TANF a couple minutes ago. Um, you know, TANF, which is our welfare program for those who don't know what TANF is, um, we have more than 17,000 families on TANF right now today. That's obviously an increase over the last couple of years. We are now discussing whether we should put a cap on TANF recipients of five years. I am not for that. I'm not for that because if folks are not self-sustainable yet, we should not kick them out of the system. And obviously there's another side to that story. The other side is we should get folks off the dependency of government, which I understand that too. But in these tough economic times, I think it's kind of difficult to say, sorry, we can't help you anymore. And that's not kind of the premise. Uh, and so Councilmember Barry introduced a particular bill. He and I agree on a lot of things. This is one we do not agree on. Um, but he did support me uh, on the TANF and extending some of the programs to make it easier for folks. And for those who don't know, also food stamps. My, one of my first pieces of legislation after I was sworn in a couple of years ago uh, was to increase uh, or change the guidelines for who can get food stamps. Because obviously a lot of folks in the lower um, middle class, believe it or not, were now having to go to get food stamps. And, so, and plus it didn't cost the city a dime. It's all federal dollars. So it was just interesting to me that we had not done that before because any opportunity you can get federal dollars to help, you might as well do it so you don't have to use your local. And then I'll close, close with this, and then I'd love to take some questions. Is um, I do, I, I'm on the Finance and Revenue Committee, too, and I think we have kind of a duty and to warn folks that this is going to be an extremely difficult economic season. And I'll give you uh, a couple of reasons why. And you probably heard some numbers like $170 million or It's really about 450 maybe 470 uh, over 2011, 2012, of the shortfall we're looking at. The reason why we were able to mask it over the last couple of years is because of the Obama stimulus dollars. And they were wonderful dollars. The problem with those dollars, they're not reoccurring. And they're now over. Uh, so because of that, we're going to see some heavy, what um, Mayor Leg Gray said the other day, was we had already cut to the bone, now we have to cut to the marrow. And because of that challenge that we're going to have on those kind of very difficult cuts, that means the folks at the lowest part of the economic totem pole are going to be affected the most. So we have to be as disciplined as possible. And then you're going to hear this politically correct term called revenue enhancements. That means tax increases. Um, I am for some of those. And so you will hear us kind of discuss that and advocate for that. And you'll hear that debate because some of my colleagues think we can cut our way out of half a billion dollars. Well, you certainly can. Um, but you'll be destroying lives uh, from my standpoint, and that's just not an option. So what I need from you before I take questions or for you that agree with my position on these particular things is to be um, to advocate, uh, to lobby uh, in the Wilson building through emails, call your council member, uh, let them know what you feel about on any issue on whatever side you're on, because we really take that into account. Because we, this is politics, and yes, we look at votes, and we folks look at re-election. I happened to, and I campaigned on this particular, I said that I was going to take the kind of votes and positions that I thought were right, not for re-election. Um, because what my mom told me is that um, I didn't necessarily need to do this job I wanted to. And when you have that as your kind of premise, it gives you the opportunity to do what's right rather than, uh-oh, that may hurt me with a constituency group and I can't get re-elected. So um, I'm going to stand for, for folks that I think want to remain in this city, uh, that folks that deserve a level playing field if they can get one. 
And in some cases, you know, I understand people saying that government should get out of the way, and I agree in some things government should get out of the way. But in some cases, government is there to help folks survive, and they provide a safety net for people. And from my standpoint, yes, it's a compassion issue, uh, but I also think it's what's right. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd love to take some questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask the council member? Hi. I own a small business in Anacostia. Well, I have two questions. Basically, there are two things going on. But I had a client that came to me with an unemployment at Wacoke because she didn't have a bank account. So when they talk about check cashing places, people need to be really careful about that because a lot of low-income people have been put into what they call the check system, which is really institutionalized classism, racism, whatever you want to call it. And I do think that the city council can do something about those kind of laws. If you do not have a bank account, if you had a bank account before, you cannot get a new bank account. If Will you be raising taxes in the District of Columbia? And if you do, will you consider raising it on the higher income people? Because I happen to be a tax and higher income people are only paying taxes at 8.5% of their income. And that is too low for them to be paying in these tough economic times. The answer to the question is um, I, yes, I am actually the proponent of when I mentioned some of the tax increases for raising uh, individual income tax on folks who are making over $250,000 a year. So the answer is yes, I am actually one of the authors of that particular bill. Councilmember Graham and I. Um, have a little. He is, he is also one of the authors. He and I are having some debate now on where that threshold should be. Clearly, at two hundred fifty thousand, you're bringing more people into the into that pool. He he likes a higher number around three hundred three hundred fifty thousand. Um, we will and that and one of the things about those kind of taxes it's going to impact me. But when we look at um, how we are taxed in this region, uh, we are we have some of the lowest property taxes in the region. So though the myths that we have high property taxes, that is not true. Um, so a lot of the fear tactics that are being used are, well, if we raise taxes on the wealthier residents, that they'll leave the city. That's not accurate. No one wants to sit in two-hour traffic coming in over the Beltway or coming down 270 or coming across Key Bridge. And since the property taxes are a little higher in Montgomery County or Arlington, actually the net-net is you're still better off here in the District of Columbia. So, yes, I'm a proponent of that. As you can imagine, uh, some of my colleagues don't agree with my position. Um, so that's what you will be seeing some of that uh, some of that debate. But we have to do a mix of cuts and revenue enhancements, hence tax increases. Yes. Yes. In light of the four hundred seventy million dollar uh, deficit that DC is facing right now, when you make a consideration for health and human services about which programs to cut, like HAMP or the Housing Trust Fund in favor of perhaps emergency services for the people without homes. How do you do that, that cost-benefit analysis, and where do you see the actual need? It's, it's difficult. Um, one of the things that we have, uh, I'm also one of the things I've fought for, and I know some of the advocates in the safety net um, um, world who, I, who are very supportive of me, I'm very supportive of them. We don't agree on everything. This is one of the things we do not agree on is the residency requirement. Because what's happening, too, is a lot of our resources, if you don't live, for example, if you don't live near Richmond or Baltimore, you kind of migrate to the District of Columbia for our services. And so if you're an out-of-state resident, you're basically taking something from someone that should be getting it here in the District of Columbia. So first is a residency thing, so we can balance to see how many folks and what the percentages are of folks living outside of D.C. that are using our services. That's A. The second challenge is to figure out how many folks really need particular things. For example, priority one housing. Priority one housing are folks that if they may be living in an aunt or an uncle's house one night, uh, maybe they're at um, D.C. General the next night, and then the next night they may be um, sleeping outside on a curb. Those are priority one folks, folks that have kids that are going to school, 
And believe it or not, by the way, the, the definition of or well, the face of homelessness has changed as well. It's not the kind of the traditional stereotypical person that's homeless. We have people that work every single day in this city that are homeless. So we're trying to weigh what is actually important and then couple it with some, some federal program dollars that are out there too. So if we do have to make the cut, we can replenish it with federal dollars, not stimulus dollars, just obviously some grants that are out there that from my standpoint, the city hasn't been aggressive enough of going after. So it is very difficult. Those are some of the challenges. And Chairman Gray, Mayor-elect Gray, last year put some of our, for, for those who are familiar with the term sausage making, um, when we had that budget discussion, he put that on Channel 13 so folks could see the debate about making those tough choices. And so I'd love to give you an answer specifically to your question. I just can't now. But we're going to have a lot of data and try to figure out what is the best way to do it because, yes, some of those things are going to have to be cut. I mean, everything's going to be on the table. That includes education, which has been a sacred cow for a long time. Uh, the police department is going to be on the table. Everything. When you're talking half a billion dollars, there's nothing that can be considered. From my standpoint, there are some safety net issues, though, that should be off the table. Um, but I think we all have to start with the premise that everything's on the table. And I think it's going to be difficult. That's why I think your input is going to be so important. Thank you so much um, for your chance to answer the questions. Um, Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And if I can, one last, again, um, kind of warning. Um, uh, Dr. Gandhi is expected to give us another forecast um, in the next, I think he's given us one in six or seven days, at least folks on the Finance and Revenue Committee. And if that number creeps up closer to 500 or over, um, to your question, it's going to make it even more difficult relative to what we're going to do um, to keep the government going. Uh, and again, we're not in any danger of that, but for those, no disrespect to the Republicans in the room, uh, but there's a new house. And what that new house means, a new chair of the D.C. Appropriations Committee. And that means that things may change relative to how we're viewed, because our budget is no different than most jurisdictions in the country. Frankly, we're, all, we're a little better off, but D.C. always gets treated a little differently when you're not a state, hence why we need to be a state. Um, so uh, with that, I want to give a little more. Uh, warning about kind of the tough times coming up. So again, we're going to have to reopen the 2011 budget. And then, of course, we're going to start dealing with the 2012 budget in the spring. So again, thank you very much. Thank you.